We are, as I said, studying the royal person of Jesus as he is described by Matthew in his, uh, in his gospel. Uh, Matthew presents us with an image of Jesus as the king of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And in his gospel we see uh, Jesus uh, in a variety of ways, uh, uh, in a variety of ways to be seen as the king. He is worshipped. Uh, we see Jesus lording over the spirits, the good and the bad ones. Jesus explaining um, what the kingdom is, what His kingdom is. Jesus establishing His kingdom. Jesus preparing kingdom workers to go out and broaden the uh, borders of the kingdom. And also Jesus helping the kingdom to grow with His teaching, particularly uh, the teaching uh, using the device of parables that we talked about last time. And so every time we turn to a new scene through Matthew's eyes, he reveals yet another aspect of Jesus' royal nature and work. So today we're going to review another aspect of Jesus' royal presence in Matthew as we look at the kindness of the king, the kindness of the king. As I said, a lot of this is in Matthew chapter 14. Now in Matthew 14 and 15 actually, we see some of the many acts of kindness that Jesus performed on behalf of the people. And this is unusual when you're talking about a king. Usually a king is the recipient of service. You know, the king has slaves and servants. Um, the major task is to find out what the king favors or what the king wants and try to provide that for, for him. But Matthew shows us how different the king of the kingdom of heaven is in that it is he who serves. It is he that fills the needs of his subjects. You know, a complete turnaround from how things work here on earth. And so in Matthew 14 and 15, Matthew describes seven instances of the king's kindness towards other people. And briefly, we're going to go through this to really complete our profile here um, of, uh, of uh, Jesus as the king. So the first act of kindness is the feeding of the 5,000, chapter 14, beginning in verse 13. It says, Now when Jesus heard about John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a secluded place by himself. And when the people heard of this, they followed him on foot from the cities. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate and the hour is already late, so send the crowds away that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away, you give them something to eat. They said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring, them, uh, bring these here to me. Ordering the people to sit down on the grass, he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and breaking the loaves, he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the, uh, to the crowds. There were about 5,000 men who ate besides women and children. And so Matthew gives the um, details of John the Baptist's execution before he describes the scene of Jesus with the 5,000. He kind of prefaces you know, the scene of the, you know, the, the, the crowd with the news of, Jesus, of John the Baptist's execution. And who knows, perhaps he was trying to convey the idea that after John's death, many of his followers began to follow Jesus, and this may explain the surge in the number of people seeking out the Lord for comfort and for, and for teaching. Nevertheless, Matthew notes that Jesus' reaction to John's death is to retreat to a remote spot, probably to mourn. You know, we keep saying you know, Jesus is the divine Son of God, but He's also a man and, and in many ways He has the feelings that a, a person, that a human has. And John the Baptist, his cousin, co-worker if you wish, the one who prepared the way for him as the Messiah has been executed in a, particular, a particularly horrific way, he's been beheaded. And so he retreats to mourn and pray over the death of his cousin and, uh, and his forerunner, uh, John the Baptist. So Matthew says that the people got wind of where he was and they followed him. So as Jesus returns from his retreat, he finds 5,000 plus people 
awaiting Him. So He begins to minister to them through healing. Notice that. So Matthew says that Jesus had compassion on them. They were hungry, they were tired without direction or hope. So He not only cared for their big problems like illness and, and, and handicaps, so on and so forth, the healing ministry, He also understood the basic needs as well. People get hungry. So His disciples suggest that they send the people away to care for their needs. And Jesus responds in a very unusual way that they, the disciples, care for them. And they answer that, wow, we only have you know, five loaves, two fish for these thousands of people. So Jesus takes and multiplies these in a way that all can eat sufficiently and there are 12 baskets of leftovers. So you know, this is a very familiar story. What's the point in all of this? Well, the point here was not a miracle to wow the crowd. Jesus used His power to provide an act of kindness as far as the people were concerned here. They needed food, they were hungry, they were in a difficult place and He uses His power to feed them and to help them. He showed the disciples that He was the source for their needs. Even if it was with their need to feed 5,000 people, the people needed food. The apostles recognized that there was a need here that could be, you know, people were hungry, it could be difficult for them. So Jesus satisfies the needs of both of these. The people needed the food. The apostles needed to recognize that Jesus could provide in every situation. So an act of kindness to the multitudes and an act to build faith among His disciples. Next, um, an act of kindness where He is strengthening the faith of His disciples in verse 20, uh, 22 rather. It says, um, immediately He made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of Him to the other side. And while He sent the crowds away, after He had sent the crowds away, He went up on the mountain by Himself to pray. And when it was evening, He was alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, He came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter, Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped and those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, you are certainly God's son. So I want you to note that he remains with the people and he sends them ahead. And he also retreats to continue his prayer. You know, he had been praying alone. The crowds found him. He ministers to them, ministers to the apostles, and then sends them all away and then goes back to his original position, which was to be alone with his thoughts and prayer. Matthew says that their boat was caught up in a storm and at a critical moment, Jesus appears to the apostles as He is walking on the water and they are afraid. Again, the miracle demonstrates His Lordship over the material world and the physical laws uh, that govern the material world. Why? Because, well, He's God. He created those laws, so He can, he can supersede those laws if He wishes. So in the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, the disciples you know, were very silent, you didn't hear anything. You know, once they said, hey, all we have are this much bread and fish, he does the miracle, so you don't hear anything from the apostles. You don't hear them commenting on, on anything. All right? Obviously, uh, they are entering a place where their sense of reality is being sorely tested. You know, I don't think they didn't say anything because they didn't care. They didn't say anything because it was like, Oh wow, what's going on? What's happening here? Ooh, you know, kind of strange. You know, we're, we're entering a very strange thing. So they're just kind of shrinking a little bit. They're being quiet now. You know, they're being quiet, maybe a, a bit of a sense of awe. So back in the boat, even in a storm, they're once again in familiar terrain. I mean, after all, they're fishermen. They understand the sea. They're not afraid of the storm, okay? But when Jesus appears to them, now they are afraid. Notice, 
Now they're afraid to the point where they're crying out. And Jesus comforts them by assuring them that He's not a ghost. This is no nightmare. This is no vision. This is no fable. Peter decides to test what he sees and he asks Jesus to let him also walk on the water. And for a time his faith is solid and he succeeds. Then he realizes, wait a minute, this isn't a dream. The wind is real, there is danger. And so he doubts and the moment he doubts, he begins to sink. So many lessons here, right? We can draw so many lessons. You know, we, if we walk by faith, it seems everything is going. Then the moment we doubt, we also begin to sink you know, in whatever is happening in our lives uh, as well. So Peter's faith is not strong enough to permit him to walk on water any longer, but by this point, it is strong enough to ask Jesus for help which the Lord provides. I want you to note that when Jesus and Peter return to the boat, the storm stops and the collective faith of the apostles is strengthened to the point where they worship Him as God. Where they worship Him as God, not as a great teacher, not as a great leader, a moralist, so on and so forth, but as truly as God. And they say it. And so, the miracle there didn't just impress them, the miracle uh, increased their faith, uh, helped them to, um, to accept who He really was. Great act of kindness, great act of mercy to bring them to this knowledge and this understanding. Thirdly, third acts of kindness, He heals in remote areas. Verse 34 to 36 says, uh, uh, when they had crossed over, they came to uh, land at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent word into all that surrounding district and brought to him all who were sick. And they implored him uh, that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak, and as many as touched it were cured. Now there are two remarkable things about this brief passage. First, that Jesus would even go to this very small and remote area on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. I mean, one who could do miracles, one who spoke from God, the Messiah of the people that was long awaited, thousands of years, and yet what does he do? He travels to the backwater place to minister to the least important in the eyes of men. A great act of kindness by the king. And the other remarkable thing was how he ministered to them. Notice the Bible says that they brought all who were sick and all were cured without a word, without a long profession of faith. They simply touched his cloak and those who did were immediately and completely healed. I mean, he healed others in other ways, speaking to them, touching them, but even that remote thing, just touching his cloak, a cloak was a powerful in healing them. So the point I'm making here is that the king showed his concern for all of those in the kingdom and that his power was available to all of those who came to him, no matter how poor, no matter how remote, they all had access to the king. Again, the very opposite of what takes place in the real world, especially in those days, right? The poorest of the poor did not have access to the king or to the leaders. Uh, they didn't have access to them. The leaders were not in service to the poorest of the poor. But in the kingdom of God, the king himself is in service to the poorest of the poor. And so you, know, you see the lesson here, right? It's written large. If the king is in service uh, to the poorest of the poor, what should those within the kingdom, should, you know, what should their attitude be as well? Okay, see the, see the idea there? Okay, fourth act of kindness. Jesus lifts a heavy burden. Now, I'm not going to read this long passage here, but I want to explain, of course, that Jewish life, especially for the common person, was not very easy in Jesus' day. I mean, their tiny nation was under the imperial thumb of uh, the pagan world power, Rome, at the time. They had dangerous regional enemies to the north and to the south. Uh, their own political leaders were cruel and murderous. I mean, Herod was the king, the political leader over them. And to make matters worse, the religious leaders had so complicated their religion that it had become nearly impossible to practice the, their own religion with a clear and clean conscience. I mean, one of these man-made religious practices was the issue of clean or unclean for purposes of worship. 
The law of Moses had certain provisions about purification rites to be performed if a person had a disease or had touched a dead animal or had been in contact with a dead person. These usually involved a cleansing and a quarantine of some kind followed by an offering at the temple to signal that a person you know, who had been sick or had touched a dead person, this person was now ready to re-enter the social and religious life of the community. Okay? That was the point of the laws. Now to these laws the Jewish teachers had added all kinds of conditions and ceremonies. There, there's where the burden was. One of these was the surgeon-like washing of hands and dishes, even if a person touched any object that may have been touched by a non-Jew. This was way beyond what God had intended and made the common man's life very complicated in his effort to serve the Lord. The, the people wanted to serve the Lord, but the conditions in order to do so had been made so burdensome, so complicated by the religious leaders that it was almost impossible to do it with a clear conscience. And so let's read verses one to nine. It says, then um, some Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered and said to them, why do you yourselves transgress the, the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever I have that would help you has been given to God. He is not to honor his father or his mother. And by this you invalidate the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. The people, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. So in this passage, Jesus reveals the double standard that the Jewish leaders lived by in their own lives. They, they, they created these burdensome laws but they did it without God's consent. They twisted God's legitimate commands in order to suit themselves. So in this passage here, Jesus gives an example. They would pledge to the temple the money that would normally be saved and used to help their elderly parents. By pledging the money, which was called korban, in some of, some of your Bibles it says that, the pledge here, this korban pledge, by doing this, they would freeze these assets and then use them after the parents were dead for their own personal use. So you understand what's going on here. Certain monies that could be set aside to help elderly parents, they said, you know, I'd, I'd like to help you, but I've dedicated this money to the temple. All right? They didn't lose it, they simply, it was there for a time. When the parents died, they undedicated it, they loosened the money so they could have access to it again in order to spend it. So Jesus reveals this hypocrisy and in doing so he stripped the people of the moral authority that they used to lord their will over the people. Okay? He showed the leaders for the hypocrites that they were and, and this was a great uh, unburdening uh, for the people themselves. So if we read verses 10 to 20, let me get to 10 here, uh, 9, 10, there we go. It says, um, and Jesus called the crowd to him and he said to them, hear and understand. It is not what enters into the mouth that defies the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles the man. Uh, then, to the, then the disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this statement? But he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant shall be uprooted. Let them alone, they are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into the pit. And Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. And Jesus said, are you still lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. So this is a continuation of the process of lifting the burden from the people. Jesus explains that we become impure, in other words, defiled or unworthy for worship, by what comes out of our hearts 
not what goes into our stomachs. It is our words and thoughts and evil intentions that make us unworthy, not, not what we eat. Of course, the disciples realized what trouble this was going to cause with the Pharisees who oversaw and taught extensively on the subject of food laws. So this was a big thing with the Pharisees. So Jesus is effectively abolishing these for those who are in His kingdom. I'm not saying abolishing all the things that Moses taught, abolishing all the things that were taught by men, that were added to God's word by these uh, teachers. Um, and in this passage, He is the guide who sees and they are the blind guys. Um, even though this, um, the teaching is a radical one, he leaves his followers to choose which leader and which guide they want to follow. Who do you want to follow? The one who sees or the one who's blind? Again, Peter is the one who uh, needs and seeks clarification on the matter. And so Jesus explains why food itself cannot contaminate the soul. It's sin that can, uh, contaminates the soul, not food. What a heavy burden is lifted here but only, only for those who are in the kingdom. For those who are in the kingdom, they're able to say, wait a minute, Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, has said we're not, you know, we're not burdened by, to, we're not you know, uh, 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 shackled to, to this anymore. Okay? And so for them, the burden is lifted. But for those who didn't believe in Jesus, who gave Him no authority, who didn't see Him as the Messiah, well, they, they heard what He said, but their burden remained because their leaders were still the Pharisees. And so it relieves one burden, but it adds another, and that is the burden of persecution that will follow Jesus. It's not as if the, 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 the life of the Christian, the life of the disciples is without a burden, okay? but the burden will be persecution on, 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 on behalf of, you know, because of what Jesus is doing, persecution because of who they are. So uh, you, you get rid of the burden of um, uh, of the Pharisees, which caused angst and which caused confusion and, and, and guilt and so on and so forth, and you replace it with the burden of the cross, but that doesn't create guilt or angst, does it? Because Jesus said, my burden is light. Well, why is it light? Because He carries it. He's the one that helps us carry our burdens. Okay, not too far into that idea. We've still got a couple of these to go. Uh, seven acts of kindness. Number five, kindness towards the Gentiles. Verses 21 to 25, it says, Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word, and his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. Now, some actually think that Jesus is being unkind to this woman in his reference to dogs. You know, and in English, it kind of seems like that. But his claim to feed the children was based on the priority of his work. And his work was to bring the good news of the kingdom to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles later, as this woman was. So the comment about dogs, you know, it looks harsh, but it's really quite harmless. Uh, he says, in, in essence, well, first we feed the children before we feed the pets. It's a question of order and not that you know, the Gentiles are, are, are dogs. Again, the true kindness is that Jesus defies social convention. He has a conversation with a woman that was not done in that time. He defies national prejudice. I mean, he converses with a Gentile, and that was not done. He also, he also alters his own timetable. He's healing a Gentile before the time uh, for bringing them the gospel at hand. He's been sent you know, to, to the Jews first, then to the Gentiles. So he even alters his timetable for this particular woman. All of these acts of kindness towards those who are in need. We see that. Number six, whoops, number six, 
kindness towards the needy. Verse 29, it says, Departing from there, Jesus went along by the Sea of Galilee, and having gone up on the mountain, He was sitting there. And a large crowd came to Him, bringing with them those who were lame, crippled, blind, mute, and many others. And they laid them down at His feet, and He healed them. So the crowd marveled as they saw the mute speaking, the crippled restored, uh, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. So kindness towards those who were in need. Now this is a repetition of the scene that took place in Gennesaret where Jesus heals many people. In this instance, the diseases and the infirmities are described in more detail. Not just general illnesses, but conditions that normally had no improvement, no cure. Blindness, deafness, those with severe handicaps, all these people were restored. Again, no teaching accompanying these miracles. They were done to relieve the pain and suffering of the people uh, that were there at that time. Now, this kindness had its effect on people and that was that God was glorified. And of course, just as Jesus said He would be when good works were done in His name, right? We do, uh, the, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, He says we're doing the good works, why? So that heaven may be glorified. Well here he's doing the good works according to his own power. Not everybody has the power that he has, but using the power that he has, he's doing good. And the result of that, you know that this is being done in a proper way because God the Father, the Lord God is being glorified because of what Jesus is doing here. Okay, number seven, last of all, certainly not the last kindness, but in what we're talking about, kindness for its own sake. In verse 32 it says, And Jesus called His disciples to Him and said, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with Me now three days and have nothing to eat, and I do not want to send them the way hungry, for they may faint along the way. Uh, the disciples said to Him, Where would we get so many loaves in this des desolate place to satisfy such a large crowd? And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven and a few small fish. And he directed the people to sit down on the ground. And he, and he took the seven loaves and the fish, and giving thanks, he broke them and started giving them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the people. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, seven large baskets, uh, seven large baskets full. And those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And sending away the crowds, Jesus got into the boat and came to the region of Magadan. So Matthew completes the sequence with a second instance where Jesus miraculously feeds a large multitude of people. His ministry of healing has drawn great multitudes and now that they are here, they need to be fed before Jesus sends them on their way and He moves on to another place. Again, He approaches the disciples with the problem and again they respond with doubt. Again, He performs a similar miracle to the previous one and provides food for this very large crowd. One further attempt to show them not only His power, but also the fact that His power is in the service of His mercy and kindness towards those in need. And I might add, His mercy and power still in service to this day and always till the end towards those who are in need. And so Matthew shows us a facet of the king's character which is very, very comforting to those in the kingdom and that is his kindness. His power over the spirits, the material world and mankind in general are enough to intimidate us into his kingdom. But none of these are comforting, however. Matthew is showing us his great kindness uh, which makes our own submission to the king something we don't have to worry or be afraid of because in the kingdom there is mercy. See what I'm saying? Yeah, he has the power to create the sun. He has the power to strike dead someone. You know, he has power, the kind of power that would make us afraid. But he also exercises and demonstrates power that demonstrates his kindness and his mercy. And that's very comforting because we are in need of that comfort we are in need of that kindness and mercy. It is the absolute power that draws people into the king and into the kingdom, but it is his kindness that convinces them to stay in the kingdom. Well, you know what, I'll make just one, one application here. 
the, the, the same parallel can be made for the kingdom today. The kingdom of Christ, which is the church, right? The church that belongs to Christ. I'll tell you one thing. It is the power of the gospel and the many good works in His name that bring people to the church, right? I mean, Paul said, it says it in Romans chapter 1, 16, you know, I'm not ashamed of the power of the gospel, for it is the I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power unto salvation. Yeah, that's what he said, more accurate uh, uh, citation there. So the gospel is the power, the news of the death, burial, and resurrection, the power of Christ, that draws people to Jesus, yes. But it is the love among the brethren and the kindness is shown among the brethren, among those in the kingdom that convince people to remain faithful to the Lord, not threats of punishment. So the power of the Lord draws people to Jesus. The kindness of the Lord through His people in the kingdom is what helps people remain faithful to the Lord until the very end. Okay, well that's our lesson today as far as another facet of the king and his kingdom, the kindness of the King. We're going to continue lesson number eight next time around. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate it.